welcome to episode 623 of the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes the not-so-classic genre cinema of yesteryear. This is Monster Kid Radio. I am your writer, host, producer, Derek M. Cook, and I'm welcoming you to the show that was supposed to be a big old zombie-filled episode of MKR, but best laid plans of mice and zombies or so- something. Yeah, You know, here's the thing. Uh, I got sick uh, this past week. I'm not sure exactly what happened. We're still trying to figure it all out. I'm doing better now, but uh, I had uh, like a day and a half where I was having just random dizzy spells and uh, not to worry anybody, but I actually passed out at the pool. Beth and I go to a local community center to get our exercise and uh, in the locker room afterwards, I kind of blacked out for a second and down I went. Uh, didn't really hurt anything other than my knees when I hit the ground, but, uh, you know, and, and I'm fine now. But it really kind of made this week a little difficult in terms of getting things done. And I know I even went on Facebook and asked everybody, hey, if you wanted to come on to Monster Kid Radio to talk classic zombie movies, what would you like to talk about? And I got a lot of great responses. And a lot of people who didn't really read the post and just started rattling off non-classic zombie movies titles, which is fine, but that's not what I was looking for. And... Uh, probably was a little more short with those people than I meant to be, but anyway, bottom line is, we are supposed to have a big zombie-filled episode this week, and we're still going to kind of sort of get that. Before I get into any of those details, though, I want to let everybody know about the music that you're hearing right now. The song is called Jug. It's from the band The 1911s, which you can find on the 1911s.bandcamp.com. 1911s is all spelled out. I'll make sure there's a link in the show notes, of course. They are a surf band based out of New York. They've given us permission to play their music on the show, and Jug was a single that they released a couple of months ago, back in April. So go check it out when you're done listening to this episode of the podcast. So here's what's happening this week. We're going to kind of keep the zombie thing going. Here's the thing about pre-1968 zombie movies. Hollywood was still trying to figure it out. What is a zombie? I find it fascinating because the zombie, when it comes to all the classic monsters that you see in movies, the tropes, vampires, werewolves, and all of that, the zombie seems to be the most American, which is weird to say considering that zombies come from a a different tradition outside of the USA in terms of their folklore, but in terms of like putting them on screen, especially once 1968 and George Romero starts doing his thing, they really became an American monster staple is that the right word i'm looking for trope i mean they really do seem to come from america's thoughts and dreams and specifically their fears once you get past 1968 before 1968 they were just another type of monster to throw in some movies and do some things with and you know are they zombies are they ghouls are they vampires are they undead are they mummies are they just well what i find it fascinating i find the history of hollywood and specifically the history of genre hollywood incredibly fascinating and you know the movie that we're talking about this week i've seen pop up in a number of zombie encyclopedias dictionaries wikipedia articles and the like is it a traditional zombie thing well i don't think so but i think again pre-1968 what passed as the traditional zombie was kind of all over the place Were they voodoo? Were they slaves? Were they actually dead? Were they undead? Were they involved with other types of monsters? Did vampires make them? How did you make a zombie? Is it just a drink? Well, Carnival of Souls doesn't answer any of those questions, but it's an incredible film. It's actually one of my favorite movies. It's something that I've always wanted to sit down to watch as part of a double feature with Night of the Living Dead. I think some of the iconography in both movies would be very complimentary with each other. It's just a really interesting movie. I really enjoy it. It's a little bit more dreamlike than Night of the Living Dead and some of the other so-called traditional zombie movies pre-1968, but it's so good, and I'm so happy that the Joy Cinema is showing it as part of its midnight movie this week. Now, by the time y'all hear this, it'll be too late. It will have come and gone, but that's okay, because I'm going. Beth and I are going to the midnight movie tonight to watch Carnival of Souls and what is going to be the absolute fastest turnaround for Monster Kid Radio. We're going to hook up a couple of microphones and talk about it on the way home. It's about a half hour drive. I'm going to take that raw recording. Not even going to edit that guy. 
and I'm going to dump it into this episode. And then by Saturday morning, there should be a brand new episode of MKR. Hopefully this one waiting for your ear holes. And uh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm a little nervous that we're kind of doing it this way, but I can't let more than seven-ish days go by without another episode of MKR. And well, Carnival of Souls, it's a great film. And I can't wait to talk about it with Beth here in a little bit. She's never seen the movie. That's the other selling point here. I'm excited to show her and share the movie with her. Oh, it's going to be so good. Of course, that's not all this episode's about. It would not be an episode of Monster Kid Radio these days without Mark Matsky with his Beta Capsule review, taking us further along the Ultraman journey and Kenny's look at famous monsters of film land, plus a little extra bonus with what he's delivering this week. That's all coming up in this episode. And you know what? The 1911s, they've been playing a little while here. Let's give them a break, bring their song to an end so we can get on to the rest of the show right now. Vampires, werewolves, zombies. Yes, these things are real, but fortunately for those of us who can afford him, so is Mark Temple. And he's good, real good. He's a former FBI agent turned freelancer with the knowledge and skills to eliminate your monster problems. And his rates are negotiable. Monster Hunter for Hire, the first volume of the Supernatural Solutions, the Mark Temple Case Files, is now available in both ebook and paperback. Go to tinyurl.com slash monsterhuntertemple to buy your copy of Derek M. Cook's latest book. Read about Mark Temple, the experienced professional now available to rid you of your supernatural, ghoulish, and monstrous pests. That's tinyurl.com slash monsterhuntertemple. And don't worry, Mark Temple is discreet. Hey, you want to die, huh? Rev it up. Action you've never seen races across your screen as you thrill to a new dimension in picture making Carnival of Souls. This is the shocking story of a who crawled from the river to race through a nightmare, walking a tightrope between heaven and hell. From the unreal, she crashes through to reality. Try as she will to lead a normal life, she is torn from a goal. There's no privacy in her life. She's ever watched, tormented. Either it's her neighbor, desirous of her physically, watching her with his leering eye, or it's the evil eye of the man, the man who taunts her, the man who wants her. From the bottom of the river they come. They reach for her. They demand that she dance with them at the Carnival of Souls. She is a girl driven mad by the relentless forces of the beyond. He will not relent as he comes for her again and again. She whirls between the real and the unreal, trying to cling to life. I like being with you, really I do. I don't want to be alone tonight. I want to be near you. Honey. You don't want to go in there all by yourself, do you? But she must watch herself in death. She must dance at the Carnival of Souls held just for her. For they have come for her for the last time, claiming her as one of their own. Carnival of Souls arouses such emotion that the management has been forced to state positively no refunds. Carnival of Souls is the shocker of all time, guaranteed to sweep you into a new dimension of picture making. You can't afford to miss Carnival of Souls. Live from the land of light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty ultra heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. Return of Ultraman, Episode 17, Monster Bird Tarotulus, Big Air Raid of Tokyo. First broadcast, July 23rd, 1971. Picking up where Episode 16 left off, Ultraman battles Tarotulus on Aku Island, but he makes the tactical mistake of throwing the monster bird into the air. 
where it's most dangerous. An aerial dogfight ensues, and although Ultraman hits the flying kaiju with his specium beam, Tarotulus returns fire with its own energy weapon, causing our hero to crash land in the ocean. After recovering Go, Monster Attack Team plots their next move, concentrating on the silver structure built by Tarotulus in Tokyo, deciding to use heat wave artillery on the monster's nest. Meanwhile, Saburo Matsumoto reappears at the hospital, where Yukiko is convalescing, with dynamite strapped to his chest. He kidnaps her, and with the police on his tail, he arrives at the nest site right in front of MAT and enters the building consumed by the silver substance. At nightfall, Tarotulus arrives, but Matsumoto refuses to leave the site. MAT works to evacuate citizens from the area, giving Go the chance to make sure the Sakatas are safe, and he apologizes to Aki for losing his temper. Yukiko's fiancé arrives, but he refuses Matsumoto's offer to talk, believing the criminal means to kill him. When morning dawns, Tarotulus, provoked by gunshots, goes on a rampage, leaving Go no choice but to attempt a risky recovery of Yukiko on his own. Continuing the noir-styled proceedings of episode 16, Big Air Raid of Tokyo ties up loose ends with a downbeat yet redemptive story arc for Matsumoto and a visually arresting flashback sequence as he and Yukiko remember an incident from their childhood. The human drama and the monster action achieve an uncommonly good balance across the two episodes, and the charismatic actor at the heart of the story playing escaped convict Matsumoto is 23-year-old Shoji Ishibashi. Within a year, Ishibashi would star in his own special effects series called Iron King as Gentaro Shizuka, a wandering anti-hero who fights evil alongside a transforming giant. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Matsky reporting. so far from the sun that climatic and atmospheric conditions there are much inferior to those on Earth. We can construct an H-bomb which, when detonated at the correct time and position, will alter the rotation of a planet enough to change its orbit to any extent we desire. You propose to move Mars into the same orbit as the Earth? Exactly. Their diabolical scheme seems sure of success until Larry Martin is called upon. And so, Larry Martin, we direct you to use all means at your command to rid the Earth of these horrible zombies. We are informed that another of their rockets is now approaching Earth. Is there time to intercept it with your rocket? No, at the rate that ship is traveling, it'll be out of radar range before we can get off the ground. Unless it lands. Then ground defense will handle it, Bob. Unless Mr. Steele thinks we can help. Yes, Larry, I do. It is the duty of my department to handle all matters menacing world security. And you're one of my executives. I realize that your work has usually been in the interplanetary zone. In this case, I think you ought to take charge, both on land and in the air. Very well. There he is. On target, steady as she goes. Firing ray gun. The public brings you weird adventure in 12 explosive, suspense-filled episodes. of the stratosphere. Within three days, the dead will destroy all the living. I am from another planet outside your galaxy. I'm sorry. I, I just don't understand. Unless Earth surrenders in 24 hours, we will begin a mass invasion. We are invisible. 
We are invisible, Adam Penner. You cannot see us. From outer space come the invisible invaders. Living dead men threatening to destroy all life on Earth. Hello there, Monster Kid Radioheads. This is Kenny with a look at famous monsters of film land. Today we are seeing part two of Fear the Famous Walkers, a history of zombies and famous monsters. Today we look at the classic pre-Romero zombies that got coverage. First up is White Zombie, with Haitian voodoo zombies bringing the thrills. It was featured in FM 38 from April of 1965. It was later reprinted in issue 60. Here are some highlights from the six page, five large photo article. Black Sorcery in Haiti, Island of Unnatural Hatreds and Voodoo Practices. I saw the picture in 1932, when I was 16 years old. Even as film monster fans do today, I cut clippings about it out of the papers, saved them, and now I can share them with you. Everywhere in the USA and abroad today are new fans of fantastic films, and I know that you too are saving information for the future. In the year 2000, some among you will have film monster scrapbooks to show your grandchildren, and to help editors of the 21st century report on the 20th century's treasure trove of terror tales of the screen. An eerie, spooky motion picture, reads the clipping, which for sheer mystery outdoes all its predecessors, is White Zombie. This picture may safely be said to be in a class by itself, for it deals with a subject which has been little short of superstition, and a not very well-known one at that. Its story deals with occult practices in remote sections of Haiti, where zombies, or dead bodies, are dug from their graves and by a process of sorcery reanimated and put to work in the fields and mills as slaves. The story is staggering. Whether or not you believe what you see in this picture, you will be enthralled by its presentation, especially when you learn that there is a wealth of evidence to bear out its authenticity. The entire picture is done with such artistry and with such conviction and sincerity that one cannot but believe its substance. Certainly, White Zombie exerts the greatest appeal upon the emotions of any recent motion picture. And this appeal is infinitely heightened by the strain the story puts upon credulity. But when one recalls that several eminent American writers have recently borne out the existence of these undead creatures, one is staggered by the fantastic exposition. Bela Lugosi, creator of Dracula, carries the main burden of White Zombie, and no more sinister character portrayal can be imagined. Lugosi is far and away the leading exponent of this type of role, and he surpasses himself here. The other pre-1960 zombie movie featured in FM was shown during Derek's Twitch stream. Here is an excerpt from the video segment produced at that time. Derek will put a link in the show notes so you can watch it too. We just finished watching Revenge of the Zombies, a typical 40s low-budget B-picture which was less than an hour. Yet it got amazing praise in Monster World 6, and was repeated in FM 52, and again in 128 in celebration of John Carradine's 70th birthday. Let's hear what the article said. What you are about to see is the photo story of a film which was based on the legend of the zombies. The film was made in 1944, the twilight year of the horror classics. But for all the shock, suspense, and pure horror it contained, it might well have been made in the early 30s and conceived in the mind of Edgar Allan Poe, Bram Stoker, Mary Shelley, or any of the other authors of true Gothic horror, whose works were, at that time, being transformed into films which have since become classics of carnage. With the exception of John Carradine, the film had an unlikely cast for a horror movie. Gail Storm, a comedian, and Bob Steele, a Western star, had prominent roles. Mantan Moreland and Robert Lowry are generally associated with Charlie Chan-type mysteries, but still far removed from anything of this nature. But in this case, the transformation from comedy, Western, and detective to master monster stars was a complete success. A special tribute is also due to those unknown, uncredited men who portrayed the zombies, the stiff movements, the blind gaze, and the rigid steps, 
made by these men created a truly shocking background for this monster melodrama. The role of the mad scientist was just one of the many masterful performances which John Carradine has enacted in horror movies. It was not a new part for him as he has frequently been cast as some sort of evil experimenter throughout his long and brilliant career. All of these performances supplied Carradine with a substantial background for this film, which he handled with the excellence of a long experienced veteran. Vita Ann Borg, who in the film portrays John Carradine's zombified bride, was and is a relatively unknown actress. Little is known of her other film appearances, but in the all-time Rose Gallery of Girl Googles, she certainly deserves at least an honorable mention for this endeavor. Not since Elsa Lanchester's immortal portrayal of the monster's mate in Bride of Frankenstein nine years before had a woman so effectively frightened audiences by portraying a female fiend. No makeup, no special effects, no grease paint was necessary for Miss Borg to enact her undead role brilliantly. Her specter-like appearance, her zombie walk, and her strange otherworldly voice calling in the darkness were wonderfully weird and beautifully bizarre. To her goes a great deal of the credit for making this film the creepy classic it has become. In a stark departure from her usual role in comedies, Gail Storm was much more than the stock terrified heroine. She made several significant contributions to this film, and before the end of the first reel, her comic image was all but forgotten, as the audience was virtually hypnotized by the awe and mystery of the entire performance. Of course, the transition from comedy to melodrama is not such a difficult one for a person with great acting ability. There is, at best, a thin line between the two. What seems most frightening to us at one moment can in the next be easily laughed at, notwithstanding... A great amount of credit should be given to Gail Storm for the professional way in which she made her debut in Monsterdom. That is all for this week's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. We will have more next time. For MKR, this is Kenny saying adios. I am Chris Wells. For many years I have told you the almost unbelievable related the unreal and showed it to be more than fact. Now I tell you a tale of the threshold people. So astounding that some of you may faint. This is a story of those in the twilight time. Once human, now monsters in a world between the living and the dead. Monsters to be pitied. Monsters to be despised. This one has plenty of fight in him. Never before has man been transformed into such hideous proportions. Never have teenage girls been subjected to the terrifying ordeal in the fantastic womb of torture. Prisoners on this island of the mad must fight desperately to preserve a sane and conscious mind. This strange and powerful story has been acclaimed as the most terrifying of all time as it bursts forth the unequaled horror of an island of monsters created by a human beast. This is Count Vlad, but you may recognize me by my more familiar name, Count Dracula, and I'm here to offer you a friendly warning. Derek and his guests often get excited, and occasionally this results in revealing key plot points of the movies they're discussing. In your parlance, you might call these revelations spoilers. You know how the children of the night Ah, I mean monster kids can get sometimes. So consider yourself warned, and don't come begging to me to kill them for their transgressions afterward. I have more pressing issues to take care of, like that pesky von Helsing. So first of all, uh, I'm a liar. <laughs> Uh, the very beginning of this episode, I talked about how we were going to go to the Midnight Movie at the Joy Cinema. And look, we love the Joy Cinema. We got married at the Joy Cinema. 
Jeff Punkrock Martin puts on a great show, runs a great theater. It's one of my favorite movie theaters. Absolutely. But I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a little ways away from our home. Yeah, it's a, it's a half hour drive from where we live to the Joy. Um, and then a half hour back, obviously. And so that's an hour in the car. Uh, and that's, I mean, not even considering like taking gas into consideration or anything like that. It's just a long time. <laughs> I mean, it's a great movie. I, I love Carnival of Souls, and I love the theater, but, you know, about 10.45 rolled around, and uh, I, I told Beth, you know, Carnival of Souls is in the public domain. We could just watch it at home in our comfy pants. You know, it really, it was the comfy pants that won it, and, and, and maybe maybe we need to have the joy bill it as a comfy pants night wear your comfy <laughs> pants that, that'd get people you know pajama night pajama night there you go there you go and the new seats are pretty comfy we can maybe just sleep over like just push them back all the way you know sleeping bag that was one of my fears is that we would have fallen asleep because <laughs> uh, i i do that i i doze off during movies i'll admit that it's something i've struggled with since yeah. god i remember doing it in escape from la uh just uh, just a long time and because movies are safe and it's you know a safe place and I just feel very comfortable and I'll doze off if I'm just a little tired and also as I said at the beginning of this episode I haven't been feeling that great this week yeah I had that weird pass out thing happen um yeah you had me worried I, you're worried I, I was worried as well and, and still worried a little bit but I'm feeling a lot better now but anyway bottom line is if you're in the area and can go to the Joy Cinema in Tiger of Oregon, please go. Please support the Joy. And if the midnight movie could be like a 10, 15 p.m. movie or something. <laughs> Maybe a get over at midnight movie. You know, that's, yeah. uh, th this is something that actually it segues into the movie quite nicely because, uh, you know, the Catholic Church has now started doing their midnight masses starting at 1030. So you get over at midnight and... Uh, Maybe that's a thought. Maybe you could do a 1030 get over at midnight movie or something. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. But uh, yeah, I was surprised there was a, a lovely uh, Catholic church in this uh, movie. Yeah. So Carnival of Souls, uh, as I did say at the beginning and in the show notes, you'd never seen it. It's one that nope. I've seen a I lot. I had no idea what it was about. N nothing. So... Before we get into the movie itself, I want to share some information with you. I feel like if I had gone to the Midnight Movie, mm -hmm. there's a chance I could have introduced the movie. Sure. And I could have talked a little bit about it. But one thing that I pointed out to you, and then I, I zipped my lips after this because I didn't want to taint the film or influence sure. it in any sure. way. Yes, the director's name is Herc. <laughs> <laughs> Herc uh, is a filmmaker of, of note, but not for movies like this. I mean, for uh. movies like this, for us, yes. For Monster Kids, yes, but... What would we? What would I know him as Chance, otherwise? Chance, sorry, you wouldn't. Oh, okay. Herc Harvey was an industrial filmmaker. Oh, okay. He did a lot of these how-to, auto safety, uh, the the kinds of things that I would show on the Monster Kid Movie Club stream in between movies, where Scott would put in the pre-show when I was doing that on the regular. Well, you know, my 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 first grown-up job, like not retail or. Or food service uh, in college was uh, doing transcriptions for trucker safety videos. So I can relate. Yeah, definitely. And that's the kind of thing that he would do. Um, apparently, oh, did he direct that? I had, oh my gosh. Shake Hands with Danger. Oh. That's a classic, man. I, I yeah, anyway. Anyway. Uh, so, yeah, he directed that. He directed the Halloween safety video from or film from the late 70s. But that was his gig. That was how he made his money. That was his career. Well, hey, look, you got to keep the lights on and then right. you can do your passion projects on your own. And this was clearly someone's passion project. Yeah, so he got involved with this project, with Carnival of Souls. He was a co-writer, uncredited. Uh, There's another writer involved as well. And this was the only real feature-length fiction piece he did. <laughs> because it bombed. Oh. It didn't do well at the box office. It did so poorly, in fact, that the lead actress's uh, agent dropped her after seeing this. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Candace Hillegas, who was the only professional actress or, or performer in the film, 
Uh, she had had a, a small career mm-hmm. leading up to this. She started as like a, a dance in live theater, showgirl type stuff. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, wanted to get into other kinds of acting and did this. And this was pretty much where she peaked. Partly because this movie didn't do too well and partly because she had a terrible, terrible husband who did not like her stealing the spotlight from him, who was all, he was also involved in the entertainment industry. Oh, gee, what would that be like? Right. <laughs> and, uh, oh. uh, yeah. So uh, I've read her autobiography, and it's pretty heartbreaking. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's been a year since I've read it, he tried to convince her that she didn't even make any movies at all. Um, we talk about gaslighting sometimes. Talk about terror by gaslight. Yeah, seriously. And she That's was on... screaming school level nonsense. Huh? Right? It was pretty rough. Pretty bad for her. Now, she's still around. Um, at one point... No, she's no longer with him, obviously. Sure, sure. At one point, she actually pitched a sequel to this. Really? Uh, it never went anywhere. I've never read it. I'd love to read it. They did remake this movie in the late 90s. She was offered a cameo. She turned it down. I don't know if she does the convention circuit. I've never seen her build for anything like that. Mm-hmm. But you can buy autograph photos from her website and that sort of thing. So uh, I think she's stunning for what she needs to do in this. I, I really like her performance and that kind of half there and half not portrayal I really dig. The rest of the cast and the crew... Probably came from like industrial films, that sort of thing. Sure. You you can definitely tell a few of the um, members of the carnival, shall we say, uh, are very excited to be in this movie. Like there, there are a few times where despite the fact that they need to be scary, there's some definite smiles going on that are even being held back. As an actor, you kind of can see that on other actors. And there's definitely in a few of these where they're they're chasing and and the person who is chasing is having a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, well, the the main guy, mm-hmm. that's the director. Yeah, I figured. Yeah, yeah that that's old Herc, who would actually get into that makeup for different appearances, whenever you show up somewhere for a signing or an anniversary of Carnival of Souls, that sort of thing. This film suffered the same fate that Night of the Living Dead did. In that a copyright notice was not put on it when it was in, dis- in distribution. So wow. it, um, and at that time, you needed it. Yeah. So it immediately slipped into the public domain. It's interesting in that it followed. I guess I won't say followed in the footsteps because it came out six years before Night of the Living Dead. But Romero, the director of Night of the Living Dead, mm-hmm. has cited this as one of the influences for his Night of the Living Dead. Fortunately, the copyright issue also <laughs> followed him. Uh, But maybe fortunately, there there is probably an argument to be made, and I've heard this argument before, that if Night of the Living Dead was not in the public domain, the zombie movie would not be where it is today. Because we wouldn't have free access to it, or wouldn't have had free access to it for so long. I can say that, yeah, you know, some movies that I think have become cult classics, you know, we talked a couple weeks ago about Monos, and I think it's a similar thing, If, if it had not been so easy to access... Once it was, it wouldn't have the following, you know, once it was True. like, once these things pop into public consumption in a way that's, that's easy to consume, that that's half of what gets them there. You know, uh, to use another example, Rick Astley would not be the celebrity he is still today. He'd just be some guy who had a song in the 80s if the internet hadn't made it easy to rickroll people like <laughs> wow okay it, it's a, he he says it himself in interviews he's like the internet gave me a second career basically well and he's embraced it i mean and, yeah and he's embraced it and so i think in some ways you got to just kind of embrace it and go with it and say you know like she you said she's she's our main actress she's still around she's still you can still buy a photographed photo you know or autograph photo of her and mm-hmm. do all that. You just got to embrace it and go with it. So uh, obviously listeners have heard the spoiler warning before we started recording. So we're going to talk spoilers. One of my favorite things about sharing movies with 
people who have never seen those films before is to kind of sometimes hear their running commentary, which you, not not con nonstop constant, but just when you have questions like, wait a minute, you know, what, well, what about this? What about that? At home, I feel a lot oh, yeah, more yeah. open to, you know, making comments and stuff that I wouldn't necessarily do in a theater. There were things that you were pointing out, though, that because I've seen this movie so many times, I've either forgotten or I've never noticed because I don't have the same perspective or point of view that you do. Like, for example... When they're in the church, she, and she comes into town, she's yeah. going to play. She's she's being paid. This is actually a full job that she's playing the organ. Like she's being paid enough, presumably, to live and at least rent a room and stuff, uh, to do this. And the priest slash pastor, not exactly clear what he is, but it's, it's really lean. They lean into some of the Catholic iconography, was, so I feel yeah, like it, it was kind of that, and he's elderly and doesn't have a wife so you kind of feel like that's the case um he makes a joke there of course they, they we've seen the scenery coming into town she's in utah and he makes the joke we're not the largest church in town and i laughed and you didn't laugh and i was like you know because they're in utah and you just hadn't clocked Did, that before that, that that's funny like, yeah it didn't even occur to me that <laughs> yeah you're you know Salt Lake is primarily Mormon. Yeah, it's, it didn't it's even, LDS land. <laughs> it didn't even occur to me that that was a thing uh, or, or the, the comment that was being made there. Little things like that that I had never really caught on to before. So I appreciate that. It is fun. And I kind of try not to give you any tells when you start asking questions that are like <laughs> revealing the twist. Like she's dead, right? <laughs> I, I should have looked at what point in the movie you asked that. But like she's still dead, right? So uh, I didn't well, want to react yeah, I to it. Well, thought when she climbed out of the river like three hours after they'd started looking, you know, that was a slight hint there. But, but yeah, then at the point where, like, she's starting to cross over or whatever right. and people can't hear and see her. She is no longer manifesting, as, as you presume, once you know. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. That, that, you put that it that it's way. never she never curled out. It's a manifestation of her spirit, and that's why when she can't hold it, when she gets upset or tired, it slips out, and then she slips back into just ghost form, and that's when she can't interact with people. You know, that's interesting that you put it that way because that that is one of the struggles that I've had with this film is that my take has always been yes, she's been dead the whole time. All this stuff that's happening on screen has all been in her head. It's part of her journey to whatever the afterlife is or as she's totally oh. fizzling out. But that doesn't hold up because if that's the case, there's a number of point of view violations that take place then. And I talk yeah. about this occasionally, point of view violations in that if it all is in her head, how are we having scenes in which she is not part of the scene? Yeah, how like, are we having the doctor and the landlady having a discussion? But hearing you say that now, that didn't occur to me that, no, she she is kind of fizzling in and out of our realm, which is going to leave all sorts of questions for a lot of people. Well, okay, like, like said landlady is clearly eager to get her as a boarder when she comes in, although she tries to play it off of like, I could have rented this room yesterday, but she also tells her, I've been keeping it for you since I got your letter. So she's eager to have this person here. And yet after that first interaction, the landlady gets more and more freaked out by her. Like she's just giving off a weird vibe. And if she really was, is a spirit, you know, you often see that trope in movies and stuff where, and stories where spirits give off a weird vibe. People just feel cold around them or weird around them or off. And speaking of things being off, that is really nicely played in the movie where I, I thought it was great that her occupation is organist, which allows us to have all, all this great pipe organ music right? and we get to have multiple pipe organs on screen i'm a pipe organ fan i grew up there was a place in town here it was a pizza place with a big old pipe organ and a guy in a pink panther costume would come out and dance around <laughs> and bubbles came down from the ceiling and the man in the tailcoat the exuberant tailcoat and top hat was playing the pipe organ and 
Yeah. So I don't know. I have a fan going way back. So that was great for me. But there is a definite moment where the music switches into a fully minor key and mm-hmm. like where the music changes and and she seems out of control and not e- not really able to choose what she's playing. And that happens a couple times and then comes to a head at one point where the, the pastor even basically kicks her out because he's like, what ungodly music is this or whatever? Right. Profane. <laughs> Profane. Blasphemous. No, you know. Yeah. Get out. But we still want to help. But but still join the, you know, stay in the church and tithe. Cause... Yeah. Uh, Gene Moore is credited as the composer. And I love it. I It's such a weird uh, choice to make. But I could see somebody who makes industrial films and training films not necessarily thinking the traditional way when it comes to putting a movie together. There are a lot of shots that are not your traditional shots. There's a lot of transitions that happen that I noticed this time specifically from scene to scene to scene uh, that I really, really liked. And again, I I think it has to do with choices uh, that was made by the filmmaker who, again, his background is industrial films. I don't want to say cold and clinical, but sometimes those movies don't have the warmth that a fiction film has. Mm -hmm. It's just a different way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. And... Or, or hearing it. And by using that organ music as a cue between reality and her going towards this, toward the light. Yeah, you know. well, it's like a cue when we're piercing the veil. So it lets there, us know that things are changing. There you go. I love that dance podium, the, the whole area. Uh, it's a real place. I don't think it's still there anymore. It's called the Salt Air. Mm-hmm. It is in Utah. Now, the beginning of the film, the end of the film, that bridge sequence, that's all shot in Kentucky. Okay. But all the stuff in Utah is in Utah, in Salt Lake City in particular. Like that. Be- oh, oh, I had no question of that down to the little boy in the suit on the sidewalk right. that you pointed out. The, uh, the department store apparently was a well-known department store in Salt Lake City at the time that uh, the filmmakers paid $25 to the customers to ignore all the filming going around. Fantastic. It was well done. Yeah. Bravo to all those customers. You did a great job for amateurs. Everybody, I think, really sold it. And because the people that were involved didn't have that, you know, I'm from Hollywood, I'm an actor, I do television, I do stage work, except for the lead. They have this sense of, or or this uh, air of unreality almost. Mm -hmm. Kind of stiff in spots, kind of just weird and I bought it now, especially thinking that, yeah, they're reacting to some weirdness going on around them without realizing what that weirdness is. Mm-hmm. Um, I really dig it. I, I really like this movie. Every time I watch it, I like it more. And I was just so ecstatic that you were like <laughs> interacting with it and engaging with it. And yeah, you figured out the twist, but you didn't let that ruin the rest of the movie. Oh no, I was I was ready. It just increased the anticipation. Yeah. Um. The dude. <laughs> Her neighbor in the boarding house. Oh. I'm actually impressed he survived. If I'm honest. Yeah. So we're sitting here. And you're like, "Yep, that's the guy we're not supposed to get attached to. He's going to take her out to the salt air. He's probably not coming back." <laughs> <laughs> and if it'd been a slasher flick he would have been dead oh yeah yeah oh yeah if this was a slasher flick she would have been the final girl he would have been dead the landlady probably would have gotten it yeah yeah so i preface this whole episode with talking about this movie's place in zombie movie cinema mm-hmm. and you know i talked about this at the beginning and and i don't know I mean, you know that I've got my zombie movie background and all that. And, and you've seen Night of the Living Dead. Right. But again, I question as to whether these are even zombies or if they're just yeah. ghouls. So this is something that I said at the beginning of the show is that the zombie trope really didn't coalesce into what we now think of zombies for zombie movies until 1968, mm-hmm. until Night of the Living Dead. And even then, there's a, a, a few stragglers that were still kind of catching up to what Romero was putting down. But up until that point, you had 
white zombie, so it's all voodoo based. You had Plague of the Zombies from Hammer oh, Films, again, okay. voodoo based. You have Revenge of the Zombies, Revolt of the Zombies, things like that. You've got some people doing brain experimentation. You've got Creature with the Atom Brain where they're doing stuff with science, mm -hmm. messing with somebody's brain. Are they undead? Are they just sick? Are they enslaved somehow or ensorcelled somehow? This movie, if you go to the Internet Movie Database, which, as we all know, cannot be wrong, <laughs> <laughs> credits so many of the actors in the white makeup as zombies. This influence is not a living dead. Are they zombies? I, I don't know. Now that you've put the thought in my head that she is kind of flickering in and out of our realm, I'm more inclined to believe that, yeah, kind of, sort of, they're more zombies than I originally thought when I thought it was all in her head. Does that make sense? I guess so. Because if it's in, all in her head, I kind of looked at those creatures as maybe messengers or other non-corporeal beings. Right, but if she's... I'm not saying that she's... Corpor I'm saying that she is manifesting a corporeal state. Right. And maybe they are too briefly, but does that make them zombies or does that make them like poltergeist or ghouls? Yeah, that's where it gets kind of questionable. And, and I think there's this spectrum of zombie from, you know... Uh, with maybe like I am legend on one end and then like yeah this on the other end but well even Night of the Living Dead didn't call them zombies they didn't get called zombies in the Romero yeah. films until Dawn of the Dead in the 70s yeah they, you know at that point in Night of the Living Dead they were called ghouls and at one point one of the alternate titles of that film was Night of the Ghouls and a ghoul is what a flesh eating monster that lives in cemeteries and such, right? I guess that's one interpretation of them. So yeah, it's so fluid and and kind of up in the air. I'm going to say it's my show, so we're talking about it. <laughs> you know, and I'm going to call them zombies at this point. I think they're definitely a precursor to zombies. Yeah, I mean if, like a, a... If not a full zombie. Them. So they're on the zombie spectrum. They're on the zombie spectrum. Okay, I like that. <laughs> uh, and you know, they do turn up in A to Z of zombie movie books and zombie history books. But then things like The Mummy turn up in some of those books, too. And those aren't zombies at all. So I no, don't know. No, mummies are not zombies. No, that's, that's no, not no. Zombie. Clearly, we segregate our monsters here. <laughs> that sounded terrible. Uh, let me go back to something else you just said a second ago, though. You sure. said something about them being on the zombie spectrum. Yes. You said something to me while we're watching this. Didn't even occur to me either about... I don't think it was intentional, but a reading of her character in this could be that, yeah, she might be on the autism spectrum. Well, just several things that, you know, being on it myself and, and, and having raised children on it and worked with a lot of my students on it and stuff and, and actors and different directors even. Um, there are cues in the character that maybe would not in the day have been thought of as as being different. Because also a lot of women who are on the autism spectrum end up being very high functioning um, in the physical world, if not in the social world. Mm -hmm. And so she seems to be very high functioning. She's this amazing organist who somebody's willing to pay a living wage of some sort to, to come out and play at their church. And, and she has herself very put together. She drives, which many women back in that time didn't or didn't own their own vehicle at the very least. Right. Um, yeah. you know, she strikes out on her own. She's playing the organ because she loves to play the organ. It's a job. It has nothing to do with spirituality or church. She makes that very, very clear. Um, and, uh, I know for myself and other people on the spectrum, many of us, we can see the beauty in the patterns and the music and that sort of thing. We don't necessarily need to ascribe a religious connotation to it for it right. to make sense or, or be enthralling. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there just were several different cues that the character gave off that, that, that kind of give, give that impression. And again, I, I don't, I doubt it was intentional. I, I, I've never read anything anywhere that says that. And if I have, I've forgotten. But an interesting reading, nonetheless, you know. I feel like it was more, if anything, choices that the actress was making. It wasn't necessarily things in the script she was given or even 
I'd have, you know, I wouldn't know without talking to the people involved if it was director-based choices, but it felt like a lot of them were choices the actress was making. And so I think provide to her that, that she she isn't just the typical empty-headed girl in a horror flick. Right. She she actually has substance and her own mind and a strong will. So strong that maybe she just can't die, you know? <laughs> You know, I've never seen the remake. I have zero interest in seeing the remake. I would love to get my hands on whatever treatment she wrote, you know, Candace Hillegoss wrote, when she was pitching, maybe doing a sequel or follow-up herself. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even know what it would be called. Return to the Carnival Soul? I don't know. But I, I, I can see watching this, and every time I watch it, I like it better, like I said at the beginning of this. And it's one of those movies that I think that has continued to grow on me. And mm -hmm. now I've got like another doorway into the movie to let me see even more because of watching it with you. So again, listeners, if you have an opportunity to share some of your favorite movies with somebody who's never seen them before, listen to them <laughs> because it, it, it'll open up your eyes even more. I think to things that maybe you, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm making sense here. It is late. It's after midnight. No, we didn't drive to the Joy and back, but I am pretty exhausted, so I'm just kind of babbling here. But I'll, I'll tell you what it makes me want to do. What's that? It makes me want to uh, host an event, uh, host like a Carnival of Souls and have everybody come in fancy dress and the makeup. And ah, that'd be cool. If only we had access to like some sort of amusement park set up. With like a haunted dance pavilion. Right, right. <laughs> the The haunted house. The scare grounds where Beth works is at Oaks Park, which is a community or a community uh, amusement park, and over a hundred years old. Uh, yeah, yeah. By lore, quite haunted. I doubt they'd ever go for it, but I'd be there in a minute. That'd be awesome. It'd be so cool. It'd be so cool. This is, you know, I'm not going to say one of my favorite movies because I have somebody <laughs> on my list of favorite movies that it might not ring true anymore even matter because i just love them all so much like picking your favorite kid how you do how do you do that I, I don't know you know how do you do that the one that doesn't back talk no i'm kidding wow <laughs> well carnival of souls is not back talking to me today okay but it is giving me conversation and i hope y'all dug this conversation it's not what we originally planned to do thank you for your patience and being flexible with us with this Eventually, we're going to go back to the joy for something, I'm sure. Just Jeff Punkrock Martin, these midnight movies. I'm too old, man. <laughs> I'm so tired. Any final thoughts? Uh, just I can't wait to see what you come up with to show me next. Ooh. And if our uh, listeners have any suggestions, we'd love to hear them. You know, I've had people tell me I should show you some Harryhausen films. Okay. Are you familiar with a lot of Ray Harryhausen? I mean, you know what Harry, you know who Harryhausen is. I, I I vaguely know who he is, and I know that that one of uh, my favorite animated movies from when the kids were little, uh, Monsters Inc., pays homage to him by calling the steakhouse Harryhausens. Yep, yep. So maybe a Harryhausen film, and if I remember right, I think Kenny even suggested at one point some particular Harryhausen films. So, Kenny, if you're listening, any listener, really, email me at monsterkidradio at gmail.com with what Ray Harryhausen film I should share with Beth. Cool? Cool. cool. Let's do it. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Monster Kid Radio. I hope it turned out okay. I am actually recording this before I got together with Beth and we watched Kind of Low So, I have no idea how this episode turned out. Fingers and tentacles crossed, it turned out okay, and that you're still listening, and, uh, well, this episode is going out either late Friday night or early Saturday morning. I'm grateful, though, to everybody who's been along for the ride, everybody who shares posts on Facebook or Twitter, talks up the podcast, spreads the word, being part of our Cyber Street team. Y'all are incredible. Thank you for being some of the best podcast listeners in the world. Big thanks to Beth, to Jeff Rockstar Martin at The Joy, to Kenny, to Mark for their incredible segments. And again, thank you to you for making Monster Kid Radio what it is for me. I've had a blast talking about these movies with everybody and getting into the zombie thing has been a lot of fun. 
I don't know if I'm going to be able to do more zombie stuff next week just because of scheduling and all that. I, I think I'm going to dip into the Monster Kid Radio vault. I actually have been sitting on a recording with Mark Holmes about the movie At the Earth's Core. So, yeah, we're going to put zombies on our rearview mirror for now. Maybe next June we'll try to do a more concentrated or, or, or focused June of the Dead. But, yeah, right now, I think we're going to move on and we're going to do At the Earth's Core with Mark Holmes next week here on MKR. So make sure you come back for that. You can learn everything you need to know about Monster Kid Radio over on our website at monsterkidradio.net. Make sure you check that out. Make sure you follow all the links if you want to know more about what Mark Matsky is up to. Or maybe use one of our Amazon affiliate links if you're going to buy anything on Amazon. doesn't cost you anything extra, but because we're Amazon affiliates, we get a little bit of scratch, you know, like a penny or two per purchase, and uh, every little bit helps. You can also become a patron over at patreon.com slash monsterkidradio, and there's still time for you to sign up. If you're a $5 or more patron over at Patreon, you can participate in the live Monster Kid Radio Monster Movie Trivia Showdown quiz trivia game thing. We really need a better name. I'm open to suggestions. But we're doing a live movie trivia game on Sunday on Twitch. Everybody can watch. But if you're a $5 and up patron, you can actually play along and there will be prizes. Go over to patreon.com slash monsterkidradio to sign up now. And you can participate in that. I mentioned Twitch. As of right now, Twitch is still running. I am showing nothing but zombie movies. Revenge of the Dead, Revolt of the Dead, uh, The Dead Ones, or Blood of the Dead, Night of the Living Dead, White Zombie, a whole bunch of other zombie stuff. I didn't include my own zombie movie. But anyway, you got other great zombie movies in there. So head over to twitch.tv slash monsterkidradio to watch some zombie movies. We're going to take that feed offline probably Sunday morning so that we can make room for and start getting ready for the Monster Kid Radio Monster Movie Trivia Quiz Showdown, Hoedown, whatever we're calling it. But in the meantime, go enjoy some zombie movies. And if you like the Twitch stream or follow the Twitch stream, I guess is how they put it, and subscribe, you even help us out a little bit more that way as well. That does bring us to the very end of the show. So I want to go ahead and let everybody know that Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC, all original content, of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 Unported License. That does not apply to the song Jug. That is copyright 2023, The 1911s. You can find them at the1911s.bandcamp.com. 1911s is actually spelled out, or just follow the link in the show notes at monsterkidradio.net and let them know that Monster Kid Radio sent you. My name is Derek M. Cook. I will talk to everybody either on Sunday, if you are playing along with the Monster Movie Showdown Trivia Quiz thing, or next week on the show. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs>